Hey friends, so what in the world does forgiveness have to do with recovery? Well, everything. <laughs> we will talk coming up and don't forget, hit the subscribe button if you like this video. Welcome to Genuine Life Recovery with me, Jody Stevens. I am here to help you and your loved ones overcome addictions. We dive into the physical, emotional, and spiritual aspects of addiction and recovery, family dynamics, codependency, and more. So what does forgiveness have to do with recovery? Everything. We all know what it's like to be hurt, betrayed. I remember the day it happened to me. How could I forget? I was crushed. I saw no possible hope of ever returning to normal. I mean, the pain, it was unbearable. And it wasn't like physical pain, right? Not in the normal sense. It was like deep and ache, like my inner being, a pain that really took my breath away. It actually removed my will to live. And for months, I lived with this presence of that pain, that that intruder, right? From the minute I, I woke up in the morning until I fell into a restless night's sleep. And then slowly, right, I began to feel myself harden. And that's when bitterness and rage started to replace that ache that was inside me. And it was then that I knew that resentment was setting in. Now, luckily, I had enough recovery knowledge to know that I needed to get help, right? This was a spiritual cancer. It was going to kill me if I didn't seek treatment. And, you know, God knows the destructive power of resentment and uh, unforgiveness. And this is why I believe forgiveness is mentioned so often in the scriptures, right? We are to forgive to be forgiven, Mark eleven twenty five. 25. We are to not let any root of bitterness spring up in us, Hebrews 12, 15. So a bitter root is like something that grows deep inside of us. It slowly destroys our peace and our happiness and our serenity and, and, and our sobriety. And in recovery circles, resentment is known as the cause of most relapses. In AA, it says, resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else from its stem, all forms of spiritual disease. For we have not only been mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. <sighs> right? Okay. So most of us know resentment and unforgiveness are bad, but what can they do to us physically and mentally, uh, spiritually? And how exactly do they destroy us? Like that excerpt from Alcoholics Anonymous so eloquently explains. Well, first, let's look at what um, resentment and unforgiveness actually mean. So Meridian Webster def defines um, resentment as a feeling of uh, indignant displeasure or persistent ill will at something regarded as a wrong, as an insult, as uh, an injury. Um, and so what's the difference between the resentment and unforgiveness? Not much. So the word resentment has the letters R-E in it right in the beginning. So it literally means to relive the offense repeatedly. So to have a resentment means to relive a wrong, an insult, or an injury over and over. And I take the position that unforgiveness is pretty much the same thing as resentment. Although having unforgiveness may not having, you know, may not have us reliving the ill experience over and over but I'm thinking most likely it will. And so what happens to our mind and our body and our spirit when we hold on to resentment like this? So we all know about the physical problems caused by years of repressed anger. So we can experience things like anxiety or high blood pressure or headaches or digestion issues or heartburn or heart attacks or stroke or irritable bowel or ulcers or diverticulitis. So what is anger if not expressions of bitterness, resentment, and unforgiveness? So if these are some of the physical reactions to resentment, unforgiveness, suppressed anger, imagine the emotional and, and the psychological problems. Because a lot of times we're disconnected from our emotional state, right? We may be an emotional stuffer like I was. And so these problems, these physical problems can be what's called uh, psychosomatic problems. And that's when our, our physical symptoms are exasperated by our emotional problems. 
Right. So sometimes our body is telling us to deal with our emotions. So emotionally and psychologically, holding on to resentment can cause um, overall sadness and confusion or paranoia or anger or damaged self-esteem, anxiety, isolation, right? Because we start to think that, you know, everyone who represents or seems anything like the person who harmed us is dangerous. So we want to stay away from people. We, we, we don't want to get hurt. And this further escalates that painful cycle. One of the scriptures that's helped me the most is John 2, 23 through 24. And it says, now while he, as in Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. The Amplified Bible says, but Jesus, for his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and understood the superficiality and fickleness of human nature. So he knew that many of these people who believed in his name, right, would later be yelling, you know, free Barabbas and, and you know, kill Jesus, right? Um, but yet he loved them anyway. He loved us anyway, gave himself for us and for them, but he refused to be defined by them. And, and as a result, refused to hold a resentment toward them, right? I mean, he, he, he died for us. So, so the spiritual ramifications of letting go of resentment with God's power is indeed very powerful, right? Because when we can do this, God can take us kind of to like a higher place. It's a place of leadership, really, where we can begin to lead others into healing, into forgiveness, and work on finding solutions rather than holding on to these uh, resentments. So, so we don't need to, like Jesus, entrust ourselves to the fickleness of human nature. So that doesn't mean that we are better than anyone or that we don't get wounded or hurt. It means that we've really worked through to the bottom of this pain. So it is a form of hardening, but also a form of softening. These two things that God can only do in a supernatural way when we work through our pain and come to a place of forgiveness. It's kind of like he can hard us, harden us where we need to be hardened and, and grown or grown if you want to look at it that way and soften us where we need to be softened, softened. So, right, because we can't change the offense and the wrongs, but we can decide to forgive and not hold on to the resentment, which will eventually damage us both physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Another scripture, it says in Peter, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly, 1 Peter 2, 23. And I think these scriptures about Jesus not entrusting himself to people, it's kind of a way of saying like, like he took responsibility for all of his own emotions, regardless of what was done to him. And really all recovery is about fixing our, or working through our emotional and spiritual issues so that we can be, right, <laughs> happy, joyous, and free, as, as quoted in AA, right? So what about the peace and the serenity and all those things talked about in, in sobriety? those are attainable, right? But here's the thing. It's a lifelong process. It's not like we just wake up and we're oh, on, a, on a cloud and, you know, life is grand. I mean, some days are like that, but it, it's a battle too. It's like when a country goes to war so they can have peace, right? It, it's, it's like the story I told you about in the beginning about how I was wounded. When I began to feel that resentment, I knew I was in for a long haul and I'm still dealing with the hurt and I still struggle with unforgiveness, but I choose every day to work toward that peace. And now most days I feel pretty good. Okay. But, but it's, it's from doing the work to get there, right? It, it wasn't always like that. <laughs> so, and, and remember that forgiveness and reconciliation, two different things, right? We, we forgive so we can be free, but, but reconciliation happens when the wounded party can see their part and humbly apologize. If they can't, uh, we can choose to not reconcile, but, but still forgive. People get that confused a lot. So how do we forgive, right? We make a choice going forward to forgive. We pray for the will to forgive. <laughs> then we begin to pray for the person. And all the while continuing to ask God to help us forgive. 
June Hunt describes this well. She has a little book on forgiveness called Forgiveness, and she talks about making the decision up here to pray for the person so that it starts in the mind. And then she says, eventually, our heart will come into agreement with our mind. So it can take several months. It could take several years. It's it's a huge process. But once we find ourselves wishing that person well, (laughs) that's kind of when we know we've come to that place of forgiveness. So forgiveness, huge, right? It's it's really, I think, one of the cruxes, one of the the most important things when it comes to uh, having long lasting sobriety, because it is those resentments and the anger and those feelings that, that we haven't worked through that can be those stumbling blocks that lead us into a relapse. So working towards that forgiveness is huge. So I hope this was helpful to you and I hope you enjoyed watching. Thank you so much for doing so. You can check out my website Uh, on there. You'll find my blog and my uh, identity course and uh, other healing resources. You can check that out. It is at uh, jodystevens.org. And thank you so much for watching. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit these.